Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I'll start with a couple of announcements. Um, every month we do a free workshop and on November 15th that's our next free workshop at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time and here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the title is Why Won't People Listen to Me? Here's what we're going to do. If you're one of those people who has tried to talk to your relatives, to your friends, to your neighbors, your co-workers, trying to get them to change their diet or look at health a little differently or something of that nature and people aren't listening to you, I'm going to give you some tips as to how to get them to do it. And I had to learn the hard way myself. I, uh, I'm only half kidding when I say that when I'm at a shopping mall, sometimes I'll see somebody who will duck into a jewelry store to not make eye contact with me because they're afraid I'm going to come bounding across the mall and talk them and try to talk them into some dietary change or whatever so I've had the you know the experience of being through this myself and having to learn some techniques that have made people more receptive to what I have to say so if you really care about people and you'd like your family and friends to eat better and take better care of themselves and you feel sometimes you're falling on deaf ears or people are just tuning you out you might want to join us for that and then the second thing is, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but the winter semester calendar for uh, the Wellness Corn Institute is posted now and set. Of course, we'll be offering the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course, which is 39 CMEs for doctors and 39 CEs for nurses and dietitians. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of new certification courses and some package deals for the certification courses combined with diet and lifestyle. The new ones are gastrointestinal disorders, cancer, children's health, men's health, how to change your habits and asthma and allergies. There are probably a couple more I've forgotten, but those are the highlights. So lots of cool opportunities to learn from us here at Wellness Farm Health, free workshop on November 15th, and uh, lots of things to get started with right now. All right, so I want to talk about infant formula versus breastfeeding, specifically protein content. And let's just start with the fact that research consistently shows that uh, being a breastfed infant uh, early in life will reduce your risk of becoming overweight or obese in childhood or adulthood. A World Health Organization meta-analysis showed that people breastfed as infants were 22 less, 22 percent less likely to become overweight or obese in adolescence or childhood than people who were not breastfed as infants. And the effect is dose dependent. One study showed that each month of breastfeeding reduces, reduces the risk by 4%. Another study showed that children breastfed for the first six months of life or longer were 36% less likely to become overweight and 49% less likely to become obese. Now there are many, many reasons why breast milk is protective in terms of weight gain and many, many other conditions. One, it particularly pertains to weight gain, is that infants learn to recognize satiety more readily when they're breastfed than bottle fed. Studies are very clear that parents and other caregivers encourage infants to finish the bottle when the infant is nursing. On the other hand, um, he or she will discontinue nursing when they're full and rather than the artificial um, uh, ending of feeding, which is the bottle is empty. The other reason may do, be due to the differences in the composition of uh, breast milk as compared to formula. Now, human breast milk is a highly variable product. So in addition to the different composition from mother to mother, no two women's breast milk is exactly the same. Variations can be based on the time of day of feeding and uh, even the term of the infant at birth. Breast milk is different for babies who are born prematurely versus those born full term. Breast milk changes during the first few weeks of, that the infant nurses as well. Breast milk for newborns contains easily digested protein and minerals and it's lower in carbohydrate and fat. Within a few weeks, protein and some fat-soluble vitamins decrease while the concentration of water-soluble vitamins increase. And then, as if that isn't complicated enough, nutrient levels will usually fluctuate during the time of an individual feeding with fat content increasing toward the end of feeding. The protein content of breast milk varies too. For the first five days or so, protein content is 2.3 grams per 100 milliliters. Then it starts dropping and it levels out at 0.9 grams per milliliters at 30 days. 
Not all the protein is even bioavailable for use as a nutrient because a lot of it is diverted to building both the immune system and the gastrointestinal tract. Now you can just imagine the challenge that formula makers face as they try to recreate a product that is as highly variable as what I've just described to you. And I've only described to you a tiny little portion of it. There are other challenges in addition to the variability. Many constituents of breast milk aren't shelf, self shelf stable and they can't be added to formulas. Some formula ingredients are made from ruminant animals and plants that the infant would not be consuming at that particular stage of life. There's no recommended daily intake for several ingredients. Many have limited bioavailability, which is certainly not the case for breast milk. Breast milk provides immunologic protection, with breastfed infants having lots of re a significant reduction in the risk of many, many diseases and infections, while formula offers no such protection. Some attempts to mimic the nutrient composition of breast milk have just been unneeded. So for example, long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids and DHA, believe it or not, they're synthesized by the infant in utero at 33 weeks and all uh, infants after birth are capable of synthesizing both of those. Other nutrients used to formula, uh, fortify formula result in an imbalance in the ratio of nutrients to one another. So no matter how far how much formula makers may try to duplicate breast milk, um, it becomes almost impossible to do so. And I haven't even mentioned yet the tens of thousands of nutrients in breast milk, just like all other foods on the planet um, that we can't possibly quantify. However, by far, one of the most significant differences, and I'll come back to this because it's very important, between breast milk and formula is higher protein content of formula. And it is uh, very well documented that this leads to an increased risk of obesity. And this higher protein content of formula is based on this incredible irrational fear that we have that all humans on the planet, starting at birth and going through old age, are at imminent risk of protein deficiency and we must do something about it. Higher protein formulas result in much faster weight gain for infants at birth and then this carries over into propensity to gain weight in childhood and adolescence as I mentioned earlier. And many, many studies confirm this. In one, researchers analyzed data from 11 randomized controlled trials including 1,882 healthy full-term infants. And this included infants that were fed low pro formula or low protein formulas, uh, low protein fortified formulas and then breast milk um, and breast milk. The, uh, the uh, ingredients that were used to fortify were prebiotics, probiotics, or both. Measurements included uh, weight for age, length for age, BMI for age, and head circumference for age in four-month infants. And here's what they found out. Using a lower protein formula, not identical to breast milk, but closer to breast milk, um, resulted in infants achieving the World Health Organization standards for growth and weight gain. So we don't lose anything. This issue that infants and everybody else on the planet is on the verge of protein deficiency, um, simply not true, and this study showed that it's not true. And the uh, researchers reported that we would, we would not lose anything or put anybody at risk if we use lower protein formulas um, instead of higher protein formulas, and we would probably reduce the risk of so many infants growing into childhood, adolescence, and adulthood with weight issues. Well, this is just one more example of why breastfeeding is clearly the best option for uh, infant feeding. Mothers-to-be should be fully informed about this. I think many mothers who choose uh, not to breastfeed their children do it without full knowledge of the, um, of the disadvantage that they're conferring on their infants. Um, in situations where breastfeeding is just not an option, um, I totally understand adoptions. I mean, there are situations where the mom is drug addicted, substance abuse, all kinds of things. Uh, formula is a necessary evil then, but my gosh, we could certainly make things better by using lower protein formulas. All right, as usual, I want you to pass this on to anybody who you think will enjoy watching it. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that many of you write to me and ask where are the references and all that sort of thing. This particular article has, um, I don't know, over two dozen references and it's posted in the Health Briefs Online Library where you can read the whole article, have access to the references along with 2,000 other articles too. So if you want to become a subscriber, or you want to talk about any of these things I mentioned at the beginning of this clip, just send me an email at pampopper 
at msn.com. Have a great day and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.